what you've seen overall is, is that shipbuilding is, is trying to leave the U.S. and go to essentially low-cost providers. But it's increasingly important. Um, we cannot rely on China, Russia, or other, even our allies to provide us with shipping. I want to give you a couple reasons why that might be the case. Uh, just go back and lesson to history. Napoleon, he lost in his uh, attempt to invade Russia primarily because he did not have a reliable way to get supplies to his men. That's the real reason. It wasn't that they were being defeated militarily initially. It was simply that they were too far from home, they're halfway around the world, and there's no way to get them the things they needed. This is at the time was the greatest army the world had ever seen. Okay, it was huge. And it was the most well-equipped, the most, uh, you know, it was well-led, it, it had, had all the advantages. You look at most historians, they'll tell you that at this time in the world, it was the greatest army that had been on the planet. And yet, um, they were defeated by, um, a, you know, a Russian army that was far there inferior, and the primary reason was this. So military superiority isn't just about having a great military, it's about being able to supply them. And that's where the Jones Act comes into place. And as a, America, we, and whether we're fighting terrorism or whether we're simply trying to keep other bad actors at check, we project power around the globe to keep bad guys in, 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 in check, whether it's in North Korea or, or elsewhere. That means we have to be able to supply. We can't just send 30,000 troops to be in Korea and then you know, have our families mail them care packages periodically. We actually have to send stuff. And um, so this is why this really matters. Now, what does the US Navy say? And their position is very clear. They make it clear they need the Jones Act. Um, it's important because without it, you wouldn't have the necessary sea lift. Now, I'm, you know, I, I'm a conservative through and through. I believe in free markets. I don't like the idea. I, I'm, I'm into free trade personally. I mean, I just, so, but I also am someone who's not prepared because I'm free trade to start selling our missile technology to people like, uh, say, the Russians or the Chinese, right? I mean, I'm not stupid. <laughs> You know, I'll, I'm happy to sell them hamburgers and, and, and soft drinks, and I'm happy to sell them Nike tennis shoes. I'm not happy to sell them missile defense technology. So the same thing is true here. Things that are fundamental to our ability to defend ourselves, we better make sure we don't give them away. And they've made it clear, and they've consistently opposed any attempt to modify or change this rule, and I think that's an important point. Because there are people who will tell you, this doesn't do anything for the military. Well, I find it interesting that's not what the military says, okay? So you have all these people who speak on behalf of. So, you know, ask yourself this. Uh, you know, Leon, if someone said, listen, Leon doesn't want a tax cut. He, he can't afford a tax cut. You, you'd probably stand and say, wait a minute. I'll speak for myself, right? And I think that's what's happening here, is that, is that people speak on behalf of them, but, uh, but don't. Well. <clears throat> Of course, it maintains a strong shipbuilding industry here. The repair industry is important, as we've just seen from a, an event uh, the other day. We do occasionally have to repair our ships. We have a, 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 a ship in uh, Japan, a warship in Japan, that's going to have to be, have some repairs done to it. Um, they'll probably do some uh, immediate repairs there, and at some point they'll come home and get the real, the real deal. Um, but, uh, but, the, but the sea lift capability is important. If you understand, when we sent our troops, for example, uh, to fight uh, in the Middle East. We spent six months sending things there so that when our troops got there, they had simple things like tents and food and that they had uh, Humvees, at some point gladly armored Humvees and armored personnel carriers and tanks. You can't just put those on a plane and take them, at least not efficiently. They really do have to be sea lift just because of the, the sheer weight and so forth uh, and the cost involved. Now. <clears throat> The, uh, the, um, so I'm trying to think now. I've already done this one, haven't I? Okay. Um, now, the bottom line here is you have, um, shipbuilding is not, um, it's not something you can just kind of turn off and on. Uh, in, in World War II, we didn't really have much of a, uh, of a, a building capacity. We, we turned that around and by the end of the war we were actually building planes and building war material so fast that the, the, the Germans couldn't even shoot them down out of the air fast enough to, we, we could replace them faster. Not that that was our goal, but, but the bottom line was, but that took four years to get th there. And you can imagine what would happen if in a four year period we kind of hoped we could just get up to speed. Um, and, um, and so really the Navy views this as a readiness issue. And um, 
if you have an, a national emergency, it's also used when we do uh, relief efforts. If we have to send tons of, of things, we'll, we'll take an initial, you know, several uh, cargo uh, uh, C-17s, for example, and we will drop off immediate, uh, immediate stuff to help immediately. But the reality is, if they're going to need any more than that, we have to do it by ship. And so we will immediately load up ships and start and get them on their way. And fortunately, because it's not uh, 1607, it doesn't take three months to get there. Uh, but the, but the, um, if you look at what happened here, now you can see the deck of the ship. It's full of uh, just you know, various uh, military vehicles. You can see that that's not really, you can put several of those in a C-17, several, not hundreds. And so this is why you have to do it this way. 60% um, of all the cargoes move there. And I just want to ask you a question. I understand maybe if it's just a Humvee, it's not that big a deal. But what if it's an A1 Abrams tank that has a lot of high technology in it, it has uranium plating on it that actually explodes when it's hit to push the uh, projectile backwards? So it's not just armor, it's essentially a counterpunch to the, the incoming projectile. You have all these targeting electronics on there that allow them to track multiple targets at one time, which is the real reason why when we were in, in Desert Storm, we were able to, uh, we didn't have a single loss and they had hundreds of losses. It was because we could see them when they couldn't see us. We could shoot at multiple targets at one time, and we had all this high technology on our tanks. And our men are very well trained. They know how to use it. So imagine putting that on a Chinese ship in a crate for a month or so. What do you think is happening to that crate while it's in their possession? I suspect it's being opened, inspected, disassembled, determining exactly how we do it all. And then quickly, right as they're getting ready to pull into court, they port, they put it all back together and, and box it all up and make it look like uh, nothing happened. That's, that's how that stuff works. That's why I'm not willing to rely on those people. And I, I quite frankly wouldn't even rely on our allies, and it's not because I distrust them. It's just when it comes to protecting my family, I don't expect my neighbors to do that. I'm going to take care of that. It's the same principle. So anyhow, let's keep moving. Uh, Department of Defense, of course, is, uh, it has its, uh, a position as well, so it's not just the Navy. We'll get some other quotes in a minute, but basically they point out that the ability of the nation to build and maintain a U.S. flagged fleet is in the national interest, and it's the interest of the DOD, Department of uh, Defense, uh, for U.S. shipbuilders to maintain construction capability. Um, that, that's probably oil, because I don't see anything on the deck, so it's probably just oil. It's an oil tanker. But you get the idea how big these are. These are massive ships. And um, so now we go on to, and that's, that's another example. Um, just the amount of, uh, of gasoline and diesel that they need to maintain things. Uh, you know, we, there's a reason why during World War II, we bombed things like petroleum factories in Germany and ball bearing factories. It's because once we took that capability away from them, everything ground to a halt. And, uh, and so, we have to have the ability to get our, uh, the, our soldiers the things they need. So it also helps to secure our borders. Um, our waterways, um, if you look at the United States, one of the great benefits to the United States is that it has lots of waterways. That not only provided farmers in an agricultural era with water, but it provided a highway that was essentially free, already built, that could take huge amounts of goods up and down and throughout the United States. Now, Imagine the nightmare of one of, 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 of big ships that could have literally crews of, of, of hundreds that we know nothing about, uh, just you know, strolling up the Mississippi and other places. Um, that creates its own homeland security problems. And so because of the Jones Act, they can't do that. They, get, you know, they can stop off at New Orleans, they can unload their stuff, and then they have to go on their way. So I think there is, um, it really doesn't make a lot of sense to, you know, you go along the Great Lakes, for example. Does it make a lot of sense to let other people, you know, imagine um, somebody that, uh, you know, a country that, a Scud missile, not that big, you could put them on a, a cargo ship pretty easily, disguise it as something else, pull the tarp back, aim it, shoot it. If you're, if you're 200 miles off the coast, it probably doesn't even hit the people at the beach, you know, it, it's not, because it's not going to make it that far, but, but if you're in the United States, you're going to hit every, you know, you're, for, for 200 miles, you can hit whatever you want. So the point is, it's a big, big mistake to assume that this is some sort of antiquated thing that doesn't matter. Um, internal security, again, you look at, uh, um, 
there, th this basically allows them to act outside of our laws. There's no real industry. Think about it. Um, there are industries that build things in other countries and then ship them to us, but they don't get to actually, we don't let anybody come to the United States and do their business in our country acting outside of our laws. Does that make sense? Words, if someone wants to build a factory in the United States from another country, they're actually going to have to abide by U.S. law. That factory will be governed by, and, and that's the same principle here. We're, we, we're, we'll be allowing people to come in to our country, conduct their business physically in our country, but not be subject to our laws. That doesn't make a lot of sense. So um, anyhow, you look at your homeland security issues and uh, the Department of Defense, all you know, federal, state, law enforcement officials, they all tell us that protecting our waterways is, uh, is an important issue and a difficult one and creates lots of challenges for them. So the Jones Act is a great, great way to help. Quite frankly, Donald Trump uh, won this election in part by promising to do a better job of protecting America and border security and so forth. I would argue the Jones Act is part of that and, um, and a, an important element of it. Um, like some people say, it's protectionist. Again, I don't see it. I see it as protecting America. It's not protectionist. It's pr just as if someone said, I should be able to sell my missile technology to the Germans, I'd say, or to the Russians. I'd say, I actually, you don't really have that right. I'm, I, I'm very pro-free pro trade, but I do draw the line when it comes to our safety. And, and I think any rational person would be. So I would argue the Jones Act is taxpayer friendly because some say, well, what we really should do is get rid of the Jones Act and have the U.S. military build its own fleet to, to supply those needs. And basically what we find is that it's going to cost $65 billion to do that, and it's not just a one-time expense. Now, to put that $65 billion in perspective, Donald Trump has decided that he wants to up the military budget by, anyone know? Anyone? I, I thought it was 54 billion is what, it, what, what that, that's, the, that's the increase over, pre, um, and that's considered by many to be a lot of money. It's actually probably not as much as it sounds, but the bottom line is it would eat up every dime of that and then some, and then do that year after year. So the idea of rebuilding your military is not going to happen if you do this, because what you're going to be doing is just building a, uh, this uh, maritime uh, capability, it's a sea lift capability. So it's important to, uh, and just some quotes real quick. Uh, Chairman, the Joint Chief, Vice Chairman, Joint Chiefs of Staff, makes it clear. He's a supporter of the Jones Act. Viable ship industry is important. It produces 2,500 mariners, which they need. And he asks, you know, why would I tamper with that? As a military man, that's a good question. And then, of course, you have the commander of the U.S. Uh, Transportation Command. Same thing. He talks about how it's uh, very important, and, um, and he thinks that it's a big mistake to uh, in, weaken it. So one last one from the... Uh, Coast Guard Commandant, same exact message um, that, that this is, uh, he, he asks what would the world look like in 10 years if we do this? And he says basically, um, how would we prevail in conflicts around the globe if we don't have that? Uh, <laughs> um, I'll try. <laughs> yeah, anybody for $10. So, um, so anyhow, what should you do? Basically, I would argue this. When you hear a conservative say we need to get rid of the Jones Act, I would just point out to them that while it's true we are um, for, uh, generally for free trade, we're for less, uh, less uh, government control on markets, we also, for example, that's why we are all, all about selling blue jeans and hamburgers across the, the border and across to whoever they want to buy them, but we don't sell our most sensitive things. And I would argue this is actually sensitive, even though you may think, it's, oh, it's just a big boat. It's a big, it's a big steel boat. It's not. It's very sensitive. We have to learn the lesson that, uh, that history teaches us in someone like uh, in Europe when we saw um, Napoleon's army defeated. So I would tell Congress, keep America safe. Make sure we have this capability and make sure that we're able to move forward and uh, have our military be strong. It's not just the technology they have, it's their ability to get that uh, and the supplies out there. And uh, I want to thank you all for being here. I realize that this is a, a holiday weekend and uh, your commitment to liberty is impressive. Let's put it that way. We're gonna Quick show of hands, how many of you are fans of the EPA? That's about what I expected to see. How many of you are fans of the EPA under the new administrator, Scott Pruitt? Okay, good, good. Hopefully we'll see a few more by the end of this. So I'm, I'm here today to talk to you about a landfill. Uh, and you may ask why would I want to hear about a landfill on a Saturday morning such as this? Well, Westlake isn't your average landfill, and there's, there's an important lesson to be learned here 
uh, that will apply to the way that the EPA operates and the way we do environmental cleanups in the future. So we're bringing it to you today specifically because this issue is emblematic, the clever ways the left takes the government failing and uses it to grow government, shrink constitutional limits on government, and get its hands even deeper into your tax-paying pockets. Uh, so Westlake isn't your ordinary story. It talks about EPA failures and scandals, robbing taxpayers, the growth of government, patting the pockets of unions, and democratic doublespeak. Um, so Westlake, just a little bit of background about the landfill. It's right outside of St. Louis. It was a limestone quarry in the 1930s. Uh, became a landfill in the 1950s. You dig a hole, you fill it back up. Um, during that time, it was mostly waste from the municip municipalities, but there was some low-level radioactive material that was dumped into the dump from the Manhattan Project called leached barium sulfate, low-level radioactive material that was left over from developing uh, the first nuclear weapons. Um, so they found out about the material in the 1990 and listed the, uh, the uh, landfill as a Superfund site. And then the EPA started the cleanup process. And here we are 27 years later, and they're still studying and figuring out how they want to clean up the site. <laughs> so there, there's, there's, a, uh, there's another complicating issue uh, to this, and, and one that's really brought it to the forefront is there is uh, an underground smoldering uh, going on at the site. Basically what happens is when waste decomposes, it gives off heat. And uh, same thing if you've ever seen a pile of mulch kind of giving off heat on a cold morning. And um, because of that heat and because it's trapped, there's a smoldering that's going on underground and it's caused a smell above ground. Now, and about you, if you're living next to the landfill, I don't really necessarily expect it to smell like a field of daisies, but the residents are still concerned with the smell and are claiming that there are environmental impacts. Despite that, the CDC has said there's no impact. The EPA, as recently as this May, has said there's no health impact. And state environmental agencies, no one has found any immediate risk uh, to health for the residents that live uh, around the site. Even the fake news Washington Post agrees that the site poses no environmental risk to the residents whatsoever. Uh -huh. But here we are, 25 years later, and the EPA is finally ready to fix the problem. And look, locals are, und are understandably upset that it's been 25 years of inaction, waiting, being ignored. But they finally have a plan, and they're ready to set it into action. So the plan is a couple different parts. The first thing that they're going to do is they're going to build a wall. Not, no, not the one on the Mexican border, a different wall. Uh -huh. This wall will be built to basically prevent that smoldering from spreading it. It contains it into an area. Uh, it will cap off through, through soil and some other things. It'll cap off the radioactive material. Uh, and it also, um, it also includes years and years of continued monitoring until the radioactive waste no longer poses a threat. So they're going to continually monitor the site to make sure there's no risk to the residents. Even better, it won't cost the taxpayers a dime. It's going to be paid for at a super fund. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Superfund, uh, there are two components to it. The first is a trust fund, kind of the same way they set up with asbestos and some of the others, which is used to fund these cleanups. And the other part of Superfund has the uh, responsible parties responsible for paying for the cleanup. So it'll come from those two sources to cover the cost of the cleanup. So it sounds like a great plan, right? Look, it makes sense. The but the question is, is, is why is anything different now, right? Why after 27 years, we finally think it's going to take root. Well, there's a new sheriff in town, and his name is Scott Pruitt. Uh, Scott Pruitt was the former Oklahoma Attorney General and uh, was really a man of action uh, during his time as uh, Oklahoma Attorney General. He was on the forefront of a lot of the lawsuits against the Clean Power Plan and a lot of the, the bad political uh, activities that came out of the Environmental Protection Agency and the Obama administration. So he's an action-oriented EPA administrator. Actually, he was talking about Westlake, and he's been talking about Westlake quite a bit, but he was on Fox and Friends last month talking about Westlake, where he said, quote, there are examples where the EPA just had didn't take any steps at all. We have a site just outside of St. Louis called Westlake that's taken the EPA 27 years just to make a decision. Not to clean it up, but just to make a decision on what should be done to clean it up. That is unacceptable. Uh, he, he's even gotten praise from members of Congress, Rep. John Chimkus, whose Illinois district borders St. Louis and the Westlake uh, landfill, and is a key member of the House Energy and Commerce Committee, has spoken with Pruitt three times about the issue, 
And he said, quote, Pruitt knows more about Westlake than the last two EPA administrators combined, and I would ask my colleagues to give him time to prove it. Prove it. So do you think uh, the Democrats in Congress are going to give him time to prove it? Of course not. One week to the day after that Fox and Friends interview that I was just quoting you, Claire McCaskill and uh, Rep. Lacey Clay, uh, Clay uh, 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 the same Lacey Clay that um, uh, put the cops or pigs painting in, in uh, the congressional halls, the same one, dropped their bills to transfer control of the project away from the EPA. Now, you may ask, okay, why is this a bad thing and who is going to take control of it? Well, the, bad bi the bill is bad news for a number of reasons. First of all, it starts the entire process over from transferring away from the EPA. So another 25 years of studying and, and, and fussing about it and paying for more studies and paying for more time. Um, it moves the, the cleanup to the Army Corps of Engineers, who are a laudable organization. They, uh, they do good work, but they're not really designed for civilian applications. Um, and it's not really necessarily something that's in their wheelhouse to handle cleanup. Now, why the Army Corps, you may ask? Well, the West Lake cleanup under Superfund will be done by private non-union labor. Do you think that's going to be the case under the Army Corps of Engineers? Mm -hmm. Of course not. It's a union slush fund payout for her union buddies. Um, it so, like I said, it restarts the, the, it will postpone the cleanup because you restart the process. And because it's no longer a Superfund project, taxpayers are on the hook to the tune of $400 million to pay for the cleanup. <clears throat> so it's amazing how the Democrats change their tone on the EPA. Once the EPA uh, focuses its full force of power to clean contaminated sites quickly, instead of util utilizing the power of the agency to advance partisan efforts such as the war on coal. That's what happens when the EPA focuses on partisan witch hunts instead of their core mission. Today, we have an opportunity to reorient the EPA to its original mission and prove when properly managed, it can handle Superfund cleanups. Uh, there's one more quote from Pruitt that I think is, is useful here. It says, quote, the Superfund program is a vital function of the Environmental Protection Agency. And under my administration, Superfund and EPA's land and water cleanup efforts will be restored to their rightful place at the center of the agency's core mission. So for lack of a better phrase, Scott Pruitt wants to make the EPA great again. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you for your commitment to freedom. Um, call, call your members, sorry, one, one final point. Call your members, uh, make sure they block HR 2632, which is the House version of the cleanup, and S1211, which is the Senate version of it. Uh, members on the Energy and Commerce Committee that are going to see this. We really need to give the EPA a chance to to do their job and to save the taxpayers some money. So thank you again. Mark Twain once famously said that everyone talks about the weather, but no one does anything about it. <laughs> For decades, everyone has talked about infrastructure, and no one has done anything about it. That's changing. As you know, one of the things that President Trump ran on in 2016 was to repair the nation's roads, bridges, tunnels, airports, uh, he famously said that every time that uh, he landed at one of New York's airports, they reminded him of the third world until someone reminded him, but you don't land at the part of the airport where the public goes, you end up at the jet port. <laughs> but his point was nonetheless accurate. Uh, we need better infrastructure. The problem with infrastructure spending is twofold. One is President Obama famously admitted two years after the stimulus bill passed, there were no shovel-ready jobs. It took two years and a billion dollars to solve that problem. The second thing is, politicians never, never, never get their picture in the newspaper or a video clip on the television news improving uh, an infrastructure project or building a maintenance program for it. They get it when they're cutting a ribbon for something new. So we tend to ignore existing infrastructure, and we go for something bright and shiny and new. I think we're going to avoid that problem with most of President Trump's infrastructure program, but there are dangers. We have legacies. The biggest white elephant legacy we have in infrastructure is what was the Tinker Toy set for the Obama administration. 
high-speed rail. Now, let me make it clear, I love trains. I grew up partly in Europe. I love taking very fast trains all over Europe at the, the, the expense of the taxpayers of Europe. Uh, high-speed rail works in Europe. It works in Japan, uh, which is a very high-density country in terms of population. And I like trains. And you have train progress in North Carolina. Uh, apparently the, ro the road, uh, the train tracks from Raleigh to Charlotte are being vastly improved. They've gotten rid of 40 uh, crossings. Uh, 12 crossings have been converted into bridges, so you no longer have to tie up traffic. Uh, apparently the road, the travel time is going to be cut to by about 45 minutes. They're trying to build a 110 mile an hour railroad, a new one from Richmond to Raleigh. We'll see how that goes. Having said that, high-speed rail, as it's currently envisioned in famously California or in Texas, is a disaster. Hundreds of years from now, archaeologists will stumble upon some ruts and remnants of tracks in the California Central Valley near where I grew up, and they will ask themselves, where do these cuts in the earth that resemble sort of the Peruvian, um, remember those Peruvian ruts you see from the air that have strange hieroglyphic pictures? Where, what do these represent? We know what the Peruvian ones were. They were built by the Incas for religious ceremonies. What were these tracks in the California Central Valley? What were they? Well, they were for religious significance. <laughs> um, environmental tinker toy enthusiasts. I cannot begin to tell you how insane Governor Moonbeam, I'm sorry, Governor Brown's uh, tinker toy set in the California Central Valley is. The high point of high-speed rail paid for by the government in America was in 2008 when two things happened. Barack Obama was elected and immediately proceeded to propose high-speed rail in Florida and Ohio and Wisconsin and California and all kinds of other states. And the voters of California in that election that elected Barack Obama by a very narrow 52 to 48 percent majority approved a high-speed rail system so long as it only cost $30 billion, so long as there was federal matching funds for much of it, so long as there was a significant component of private financing, and so long as the trip from San Francisco to Los Angeles would take no more than 160 minutes, that's two hours and 40 minutes, and so long as the average one-way price in today's dollars was no more than $55. Now, that's a great sales job. It's also preposterous. Uh, we now expect that at current rate of construction, the first section of this uh, Tinker Toy set uh, will come online in about 10 years. They are already building it because you've heard the theory, if you build it, they will come. Well, there's another theory about government infrastructure projects. If you build some of it, you'll be able to sucker the people into finishing it. Now, the problem in California, and we'll get to Texas in a minute, the problem in California is very simple. Between San Francisco and San Jose, you have existing commuter rail tracks, and if you tore them up and put in high-speed rail tracks, you'd have a, a revolt by the property owners who have spent millions of dollars buying their houses and keeping away people's noise from them. In Los Angeles, you have to drill through the mountains, the Cajon Pass, the Tejon Pass, and you have to get to Los Angeles. That is a daunting uh, architectural and infrastructure challenge. And in the Central Valley, you have no people. Uh, only 3% of the proposed market for this train live in the Central Valley. There are 7 million people in the Bay Area. There are about 18 million people in the Los Angeles area. This, by the way, is less than one-third the population density of the Japanese corridor through which the Shinkansen, the bullet train, runs. Which, by the way, is a great train, and I've ridden on it. Uh, during the morning and evening rush hours, it comes every four minutes. 
It is fast, it is on time, it even makes its operating costs back, and the average fare is over $200. California's train, of course, will not be able to make the two-hour and 40-minute run because it will have to go at conventional speeds from San Francisco to San Jose because of the environmental objections, and it will have to make, do the same thing in Los Angeles through the suburbs there. You cannot have the train go fast enough in the area in between to, co to conceivably meet that standard. So there are various lawsuits that are being filed and are being appealed saying the, Ca the California voters were sold a bill of goods, uh, money is being diverted from the California e emissions tax, the carbon tax that California passed to pay for the air rail against state law. That is also tied up in court. But they're building it anyway. Uh, the first stretch of road is, a uh, track is 27 miles long. It extends from the town of Madera. Well, Madera is not nowhere. It's somewhere to 17,000 people who live there. <laughs> Madera to the bustling inter metropolis of Fireball, which is next to Tumbleweed. Uh, <laughs> I have been to Fireball, a dot in the road, which is home to 137 charming people. So the people of Fireball are going to have access to the fastest train in the world <laughs> in order to travel down the road 27 miles to Madera, where I understand there's a great Walmart. <laughs> the only problem is you have to take the train back with all your groceries. That's going to work. Anyway. I'm sorry? Yeah, okay. There you go. There you go. So California, I'm afraid we're going to see one of the great disasters of fiscal prudence ever created. I don't think it will ever be finished. I think we'll all be dead by the time someone actually steps on a high-speed train that travels uh, from San Francisco to Los Angeles. But a lot of money and a lot of, uh, I think, wasted energy is going to be put into that. The only good thing about the California high speed rail system is it has eclipsed attempts to secure government funding for Elon Musk's Hyperloop. The Hyperloop would be on stilts, it would be a vacuum tube that would transport people from Los Angeles to San Francisco at the speed of sound, or something approaching it, uh, well over 800 miles an hour. Uh, he, Elon Musk believes it will only cost $8 billion, that's about 1 20th of what the actual costs others suggest would be. And the only good thing about the California High Speed Rail Project is no one is now proposing subsidizing Elon Musk's hyperlink vacuum tube. Texas is building high-speed rail. This is claims it's a completely private venture with only private financing. However, they insist that they may have to take out loans to build this. Eminent domain is going to have to be used between Dallas and Houston, which are the terminus points for this rail system. Uh, Vice President Biden came and cut the ribbon, said it was very exciting, uh, said this is going to be a new era of job creation. And uh, the, unfortunately, all of the counties in between Dallas and Houston hate the idea. They hate the idea because of domain reasons. They hate the idea because of the disruption. They hate the idea because uh, the only way the train works is if you have no stops between Dallas and Houston, which sort of disadvantages the people who live in between. <laughs> now, having said that, there are exceptions. The bright side train system, which is not high speed, is being constructed with completely private money. A billion dollars has been raised. It's going to cut the time to go from Miami to West Palm Beach by 30 minutes. Uh, if you've ever traveled between West Palm Beach and Miami, you know it can be a parking lot on the highway. Uh, the train system there uh, does work, but it's slow. This will speed it up so that you can travel between Miami and West Palm Beach in something like 75 minutes. That'll be, that'll be great. So better trains are in our future. High-speed trains are the province of two groups of supporters. Science fiction techno geeks who <laughs> never met uh, a bright and shiny project paid for by somebody else that they didn't like, and liberals who believe it is a job creator and that they can then cut, have their politicians go out and cut ribbons on. Uh, I believe that it is of advantage to all of us even though these projects may be far away from you, to stand up and say, we have a country where bridges are falling down, 
Roads have been badly maintained. Uh, there are all kinds of states that are doing public-private partnerships. Some states are even building toll roads. I know that's very unpopular in Charlotte and did not lead to Governor McCrory's popularity growing up uh, in the last election. But there are all kinds of innovative ways to improve our infrastructure, and those should all be pursued. I think we can all agree, and we should agree, let's get the basics right first. Let's repair and improve our existing infrastructure. Let's look for ways to have better and technologically advanced systems. For example, New York State is getting rid of all toll road, toll plazas. You literally will have an easy pass, so you go back and forth. If you don't have the easy pass, your license plate is going to have a picture taken of it, and you'll get not, not a ticket, not a fine, but you'll get the ticket, the cost, which at a higher price in the mail to the place that you registered your car and registered your address for the DMV. So we can make progress, but the best way to make sure we don't improve our infrastructure and the best way to reduce public support for improving infrastructure is to waste money on projects that are for the beneficia beneficiaries of ego-starved politicians and not for actual people who sit in traffic. Thank you very much.